Did you hear about yesterday's talk? My oldest son and his wife are coming back home because they're having the baby. Can you move your things outside for now? Sorry, but you won't have kids anyway. Since you're not helping with my son's work, could you clear out the room at least? I thought I was paying $5,500 for rent. It's all getting too much to handle. Living with my mother-in-law is tough. And now with my brother-in-law and his wife coming back, my mother-in-law wants me out of the house. With my mother-in-law, brother-in-law, his wife, and my husband all here, this house is full of problems. I've been managing fine until now, but it's all becoming too much. I've decided not to dwell on it anymore. Got it? I'm leaving. I can't just leave my stuff outside, so I'll come back for it later. You're leaving. Thank you, that helps. Ignoring my cheerful mother-in-law, I packed my things and left the house. Just seven seconds after stepping out, I grabbed my smartphone and called a junk removal service. Now, free from overthinking, nothing could hold me back. My name is Allison. I'm 40 years old and I work as an IT consultant. My husband Dylan, also 40, owns three restaurants as a self-employed entrepreneur. Despite our age, people often assume we've been married a long time and have kids. In reality, we're newlyweds. We both focused on our careers for years. So we didn't tie the knot until now. Approaching 40, I had given up on marriage. But everything changed when I dropped by my future husband's bar one night after work. Is this your first time here? Yes, it is. I've been curious about this place for a while because it looks stylish, but it's tough to come alone. After a hard day at work today, I decided to treat myself and finally come in. I felt relieved to find a comfortable seat at the counter where I could sit alone. We have many women who come here alone, so feel free to visit anytime. Sitting at the end of the counter, my husband greeted me with a smile. I knew he was just trying to attract a new customer. Despite knowing it was part of his customer service, as someone nearing 40 without many friends to dine casually with, I appreciated his friendly approach. As I started feeling at ease in my husband's restaurant, I became a regular visitor. It became normal for me to sit at the end of the counter while my husband chatted with me during meals. So, what exactly does an IT consultant do? We help companies with their IT needs, strategic solutions, and I've even worked with restaurants. For example, I suggested a system where orders can be taken on tablets to save on labor costs and improve efficiency. Oh, I've seen those systems lately. How much does that cost? Well, for a place this size, it would be around this much. No way, that's too expensive. I definitely can't afford that for a small private business. When I showed him the numbers on my smartphone's calculator, Dylan shook his head and hands vigorously. He was always curious and eager to apply new information in his work during our conversations. Even though our chats seemed casual, he was genuinely dedicated to his job, and I found myself gradually drawn to him. Likewise, he admired my hard-working nature. I'm usually busy with work and can't chat for long. How about we go out for dinner sometime? Excitedly agreeing to dine with a restaurant owner, I was thrilled. Being invited by my husband made me happy, but at nearly 40, it felt awkward to admit to such girlish feelings, so I kept them to myself. My husband continued to invite me out for meals regularly. As adults, frequent dining naturally led to romance. After dating for two years, we got married when we both turned 40. Feeling embarrassed about being a bride at 40, I asked my husband to skip a wedding ceremony and just have a photo wedding. After getting married, I moved from my single apartment to my husband's house. His house is a three-story home with a garden and parking, situated in a fancy neighborhood. The rent is $5,500. He shared this place with his mother, Kelly. Some might find it unusual to live with a mother-in-law right after marriage, but at 40, I didn't mind much. Besides, Kelly is 70 and my father-in-law had passed away, so living together made sense. When my husband suggested living with his mother, I agreed right away. But once we started living together, I began to regret my decision. After moving in, I not only had our bedroom but also a separate room for my work. The house felt too big for just the two of us, with plenty of extra rooms. As I settled in, I asked my husband a simple question. Why did you choose such a large house for just the two of you? Did I mention I have an older brother? After college, he left home and we haven't heard from him much since. He moves around a lot and might come back to live with mom and me if he runs into trouble. That's why I rented this slightly bigger house. It might be more space than we need, but it worked out well since we got married. 
As my husband unpacked my books and placed them on the shelf, he chuckled and shared stories about his brother Sam. According to him, Sam struggled with jobs and moved frequently, but my husband didn't seem to judge him harshly. Don't mention that boy. What if he actually comes back? Standing at the entrance of what would be my workroom, it was clear Kelly didn't approve of her eldest son. Unlike my husband, who empathized with Sam, as a mother, I could understand why Kelly showed such a cold attitude toward him for neglecting his responsibilities. However, I worried that Dylan, who held a more forgiving view of his brother, might eventually clash with me over Sam. Plus, I'm not fond of you either. Come on, Mom. We're all going to live together now, so please stop saying things like that. I'm not asking you to leave, but we need to clarify things up front, right? Kelly walked away, her slippers making noise. I'm sorry about that. I'll talk to her. It's okay. She said similar things when we got married. I'll work on building a relationship with your mother as we live together. I took a book from Dylan's still hand and placed it on the shelf. Kelly seems to disapprove of my age. I'm 40, so having children might be challenging, though not impossible. Besides, Sam, the eldest son, isn't married and doesn't have children either. This means Kelly might never have a grandchild as things stand. She's disappointed because she probably thinks Dylan should have married someone younger. To Kelly, Sam, who hasn't fulfilled his responsibilities as the eldest son, and me, who can't fulfill my role as a traditional wife, probably seem alike. While I empathize with her feelings, I can't change my age. Once we finished moving and started our married life, Kelly started openly ignoring me. She wouldn't respond when I spoke and tried to avoid interacting with me as much as possible. It's a bit lonely, but at least I haven't faced any harassment or violence so I guess it could be worse. Building a relationship with Kelly will take time. Right now, my main concern is Dylan, and I'm worried about him. Is work going okay for you? No, it's pretty tough. I need to take action quickly. Managing finances has also become challenging. After dinner, Dylan sat at the dining table, his head in his hands. I stopped washing the dishes and sat down across from him to listen. Times are tough. Prices are rising, expenses are increasing, and customers are cutting back. There's no end in sight to this situation. If it continues like this, I might have to close another restaurant. A year into our marriage, things took a downturn at Dylan's restaurants. One of the three stores had already shut down, and it seemed another might follow soon. Seeing Dylan's pained expression distressed me deeply. However, Kelly appeared unaffected by it all. It's your fault for not helping out at the store. Instead of supporting your husband, you only focus on your work. Can you honestly say you're fulfilling your role as a wife? Kelly's words cut through her conversation, overheard from the next room where she sat on the sofa. I wondered what she was thinking during such a tough time for Dylan, but she had her own perspective. Dylan has been running his own business for nearly 10 years, overcoming various challenges. I believe he'll overcome this too. Don't look so worried. Your anxiety is only adding to his stress. Are you trying to see him fail? That's not fair of you. Kelly yelled from the living room to the dining room again, her words aimed like barbs at me. I knew her intent wasn't just to motivate me, but what she said had some truth. I chose to take her words positively, giving a reassuring smile to my worried husband, and vowed to support him through everything. A year later, as Kelly had predicted, Dylan managed to stabilize his stores, avoiding the closure of the second one. See, I told you so. You were a foolish wife who couldn't trust her husband. Don't drag him down. As a consequence, Kelly, who had been ignoring me, now freely insulted me. While it seemed our relationship had deteriorated, Dylan's business was thriving, so I tried to see it as a balanced situation. However, this incident clearly had a negative impact on me. With the store finances improving and money becoming more available, Dylan seemed to get carried away, and I started hearing rumors of his infidelity. What is he thinking? If he has money, surely there are better ways to use it. It's strange how problems seem to snowball. I had seen Dylan's business struggle before, but I never imagined this pattern would affect my personal life too. Dylan, there was a call from Sam, my brother. Yeah, what's up? Well, it turns out Sam's girlfriend, who works with him at the bar, is pregnant. They want to talk to you about something. Why so formal all of a sudden? Sam and his girlfriend are both part-timers, and with a baby on the way, they're facing some tough times. They asked if they could move in here. They also wondered if you could give them jobs at your restaurant. 
Dylan was alone in the living room watching TV and I observed him from the dining room, contemplating how to broach the subject of the affair. Just then, Kelly entered the living room and began discussing Sam with Dylan, leaving me completely out of the loop as they quickly delved into a serious conversation. It was an oddly discordant scene. Despite her previous reservations, Kelly was now urging Dylan to welcome Sam. The reason was simple, a grandchild. She had resigned herself to never seeing her grandchild, but now that it was a possibility, she had a change of heart. Not only was she willing to let Sam move in and work at Dylan's restaurant, but she was also offering generous terms. While Dylan harbored no ill will toward his brother, and renting the large house had been partly for such contingencies, the situation had shifted and now I was involved. Isn't it strange for Sam and his wife to move into this house? I glanced at my husband from the dining room to the living room. He met my gaze with a troubled expression. Come on, it's a good thing. Sam's in a tough spot and Dylan has the means to help him out. Yeah, I understand. I sighed, disappointed by my husband's lack of resolve. I had hoped he would firmly refuse his mother's demands, but it seemed my hopes were futile. Dylan seemed worried about how I'd react, glancing at me repeatedly. With tensions rising between him and his mother, his affair, and now living with his brother and sister-in-law, problems were mounting. Feeling overwhelmed and unsure where to start, I decided to stop overthinking and just go to bed. The next day, a holiday, I slept in until nearly noon, mentally exhausted. With Dylan at work, it was just Kelly and me at home. Dreading potential criticism for sleeping late, I reluctantly joined her in the living room. You slept in quite late. Must be nice. Expecting her usual scolding about my role as her daughter-in-law, I tensed up, but her words took me by surprise. Did you hear about yesterday's conversation? My eldest son and his wife are coming back home for the birth. Clear out your belongings from the yard. Still grotty, I struggled to grasp her meaning. Was she telling me to move my things outside or leave the house? You won't have children anyway. You're not helping with my son's work. So you should clear out the room for Sam and his family. With two spare rooms available, if you move out and we use your office, they'll have a bedroom, a children's room, and a storage room. Doesn't that seem like the right number in use of rooms? It became clear she was asking me to vacate my office so it could be used as storage for my brother-in-law's family. I felt pushed out just so they could use a room for storage that seemed unnecessary. Originally, I had been given the office because there were spare rooms and losing it didn't seem like a big deal. Just our bedroom would have sufficed for me, allowing my brother-in-law's family to live here without me needing to leave. Maybe Kelly, seeing the possibility of having grandchildren visit, had decided there was no longer a reason for me, her daughter-in-law, to stay in this house. I thought, I'm paying $5,500 in rent. This is all becoming too much to handle. Needing to clear my mind, I let my thoughts rest for a moment. The silence between Kelly and me was filled with the loud ticking of the living room clock. Finally, I made a decision. All right, I'll leave. I can't just leave my belongings out in the yard, so I'll come back for them later. You're leaving. Thank you, that helps. Ignoring my joyful mother-in-law, I packed my things and left the house. Seven seconds after stepping out the door, I pulled out my smartphone and called a waste collection service. Once I made up my mind, there was no turning back. There might be regrets later, but for now, I was resolute. Deciding to stay at a hotel temporarily after leaving, I had arranged for the waste collection service, but some preparations were still needed. It turned out to be a good opportunity for me to gather my thoughts. Two weeks later, I rented an apartment and began living alone. Dylan hadn't reached out to me since I left. Perhaps he assumed I would return eventually. His nonchalant attitude toward the situation frustrated me. Today, following the regular closing day of Dylan's restaurant, he should have called me when preparing for lunch service. What's happening? As I expected, the restaurant was completely empty. Dylan called. I can explain over the phone, but it would be better if your mother was there too. I'm heading to the house now. Can you come back? You can't open the restaurant anyway, right? I couldn't help but laugh before hanging up. Dylan must have been shocked. Chuckling to myself, I began to get ready to leave. What in the world? The fridge, cooking equipment, tables and everything essential from Dylan's restaurant are gone. Did you do this? Do you think you can get away with this for free? Kelly shouted as I arrived at the house. It seemed Dylan had only partially explained the situation. 
A couple I didn't recognize was in the living room, presumably Sam and his wife. They looked uneasy, struggling to grasp the tension, especially with Kelly's intense anger. Why did you do this? Now the store can't operate. It's my shop, so there shouldn't be any problem if I decide to close it down or arrange for the waste collection service to dispose of the items I purchased. What? Your shop? What are you talking about? You haven't explained this to your mother properly, have you? Explain it clearly yourself. Remember how my store had the main branch and a struggling second branch? Yes, I remember, Dylan. I made changes, new tables, signs, upgraded equipment to expand the menu, and larger refrigerators and freezers. You really put in the effort to turn things around, didn't you? About that, Allison was the one who paid for all those expenses. Ha! Huh, what do you mean? Upon hearing Dylan's words, my mother-in-law looked troubled. She seemed to struggle to grasp the full picture. Dylan seemed hesitant, fidgeting as if holding back. As the conversation stalled, I stepped in to explain. I was single until just before turning 40 and worked as an IT consultant. We didn't have a wedding or buy a new house, so I had saved quite a bit. That's why I lent Dylan $100,000 to help save this struggling second store. $100,000? Even for a married couple, that's not an amount you just hand over lightly, right? So, I bought the rights to the second store and became the owner. Even though I'm technically the owner, Dylan handles everything on the ground. He runs the shop just as he did before. The only real change was that Dylan left the main store to someone else and focused on reviving the second store. When my husband's store was struggling, I stood by him, showing concern. That's when Kelly criticized me for not trusting Dylan, which strengthened my resolve to support him completely. So, I decided to use the money I had saved while I was single to help him. Dylan, is that true? Yes, it's true. Allison said it was fine if the investment failed and we lost the $100,000 but she gave me the money. Since it was a significant amount, I suggested that if the business failed anyway, she might as well become the owner. We plan to repay the $100,000 loan from the store's profits gradually, but it seemed more straightforward for Allison to directly own the store. If she took over like this, the money flow would be clear, and Allison could decide whether the store should stay open or not. Could something like that really happen? It's hard to believe when it's suddenly sprung on you. That's why I brought evidence to show you. I laid out documents like the business license, fixture transfer agreement, and lease agreement on the table, all proving that I am the store owner. Kelly's face turned red as she verified my name on these documents. Why did you keep this a secret? You always said you trusted him and that the store was turning around, just as I said, right? You've been telling Dylan that ever since I married into this family. Dylan felt pressured by those words but tried to meet your expectations to avoid disappointing you. You tend to take a very cold attitude towards people who don't fulfill their roles, like me or your other son, right? That's why Dylan couldn't tell you about the large sum he borrowed from me. You should have said something. That's why Dylan can't speak up. People like you don't realize the pressure you put on others. It might seem simple to speak up, but for the person under pressure, it's much more burdensome than you can imagine. And while you say they should speak up, if they actually did, you'd just end up disappointed and complaining. It's crucial not to break Dylan's spirit with your criticisms. That's why, now that the store is recovering, I also kept quiet. But when it came to Sam's family returning, I really wish Dylan had said no. Kelly might have told Dylan that he had the power to assist his brother's family, leading him to think it was work-related. In his mind, he apologized to Mom and Allison, feeling regretful for his indecisiveness. He believed their reliance on Allison's money stemmed from his own weakness. If Allison decided to close the shop, he wondered about the part-time worker's fate. Don't worry, I've already informed everyone that the shop is closing in two weeks, and they understand. I've also arranged part-time jobs for those interested in other restaurants through my IT consulting connections. That's a relief. I was concerned about that so everyone conspired to surprise me with an empty shop and kept the closure a secret. Dylan, I'm sorry for pushing you too hard, and Allison, I apologize for everything. I won't ask you to leave anymore. Dylan and Kelly began apologizing, trying to smooth things over, but I wasn't convinced. There was still more to discuss. Next up, the divorce papers. I laid the divorce papers on the table, and Dylan picked them up with wide eyes. What does this mean? Why divorce? 
I thought we were working towards reconciliation. Don't assume reconciliation on your own. I may not have shown it, but I know about your affair with the part-timer. All the part-time workers are aware of it. That's just a rumor, isn't it? You can't say such things without evidence. I showed Dylan the images sent by a part-time worker on my smartphone, placing it among the scattered documents on the table. This is a photo of you entering a hotel that was taken and sent by a part-timer. If two people leave the shop together and head towards the nearby hotel district, anyone could have easily taken such evidence photos, not just police or detectives. Maybe you became overconfident after getting the second shop back on track, but you've definitely gone too far. While I became the owner of the shop, I'm not involved in day-to-day -day operations. However, I can't avoid visiting occasionally. That's when the part-time workers informed me about your affair. They were disturbed and wanted me to intervene. When I promised to handle it, they cooperated by sending me evidence photos and keeping the shop's closure a secret from you. Wait, you're closing the second shop and divorcing me. What about the rent for this place? The rent here? What do you mean? Ah, I had mentioned that yet. I've been paying the full rent of $5,500 for this place. Is that true too? Yes, it is. When the store's revenue started to drop, I initially asked Allison to split it, but as things worsened, she ended up paying it all. $5,500 a month is the same amount as my salary, so I've been covering the rent, and Dylan has been paying for groceries and utilities. If we divorce and the shop goes back to being just one main store, obviously, Allison can't afford to stay here anymore. As our conversation unfolded, both my husband and my mother-in-law seemed to slump like tired boxers after a grueling match, finally understating the gravity of the situation. My brother-in-law and his wife cautiously joined the discussion. What? What does that mean? We come back and there's no place for us to live. Wait, Sam, that's not what you told me. Didn't you say everything would be sorted once we returned home? I'm sorry, brother. Right now, I don't have a shop or a home to offer you. Come on, do something. We're expecting a baby. Can't you at least give me a job? We already have enough staff. In fact, I need to cut back on payroll. Dylan will figure something out. Just give him some time. Stop saying that. What about my home and job? Dylan Kelly and Sam begin arguing about their future prospects. Sam's wife, whom I barely knew before, looked uneasy amid the news of the shop's closure and our impending divorce. My role was over. I was exhausted from constantly mediating between my husband, his mother, and now his brother's family. I refused to live with my brother-in-law's family. What happens to this house next is no longer my concern. They can discuss and sort it out among themselves. Amidst the heated exchanges, I quietly left the house. Later, armed with evidence of the affair, I smoothly filed for divorce. I could have sought compensation for the affair, but money wasn't my priority. Given my career, I preferred to minimize any further interaction with my ex-husband and his family. After the divorce, my ex-husband found himself unable to afford the rent, forcing him and his family to move out of the spacious house. Financially and emotionally strained, he attempted to shift the responsibility of caring for his mother onto his brother, sparking a bitter feud over familial duties. In the end, my ex-husband had no choice but to take his mother in, but the conflict irreparably damaged their relationship. As a result, my ex-brother-in-law and his family disappeared again, opting for isolation. Witnessing their discord only exacerbated tensions within the family. My ex-husband and his mother now coexist begrudgingly in a smaller apartment, their interactions reduced to awkward silences. My decisive actions precipitated the breakdown of one family unit. Following the divorce, I took charge of closing the shop, a process that was challenging but necessary as the new owner. Fortunately, selling the shop's recent appliances helped offset closure costs. Though my stint as a restaurant owner was brief and closing the shop was a new experience, it proved valuable for my future in IT consulting. It's become clear that my career suits me better than marriage. With this realization, I wholeheartedly dedicate myself to my job each day.